So we left off um, in part two. This is part three of uh, lecture 18 of aerospace propulsion. We left off with this question of uh, what would happen if we suddenly had a drop in combustion efficiency. And the answer is this could make the flame become extinguished. Basically, if the combustion efficiency is too low, the temperatures would not be hot enough to sustain the combustion process. So this could lead to the flame being extinguished. And the flight condition where this is actually a concern is at the start of the descent. Basically, we're up at cruise altitude, but we have a small thrust requirement. These concerns give rise to one of the important design constraints on combustors, which is the requirement to be able to do mid-air relight. Basically, if the flame is extinguished at altitude, we have to be able to turn the engine back on. So this is a huge requirement for engines and combustion chambers. It's critical in certification. If that flame goes out, you lose power um, extraction capability from the turbines very quickly, and the compressor quickly loses pressure rise. Even then, and at a cruise altitude, you need to be able to restart the engine. This basically sets the lower bounds on the acceptable combustion efficiency. And it essentially sets the minimum residence time for fuel and air so that the reaction can take place. So this sets the, determines the minimum allowable volume of the combustor. Now the walls of the combustor are cooled in a similar manner to the turbine vanes. Just like in turbines, the gas temperatures in the combustor are, not, are, are, are hot enough to destroy the metal structure in, in minutes. So we need cooling air to prevent this. It's much easier than in turbines. The cool air is in ready supply from the compressor outlet. To minimize the cooling needs, we want to have a minimum amount of surface area of metal relative to the flow passage area. So the solution to this is the annular combustor. These annular combustors keep the area to cool very small. So um, you basically have a single large annular combustion chamber through which the rotor shafts pass in the middle. And an outer flow of cooling air also creates a barrier between the combustion hot gases and the outer casing. The inner casing is often protected with a uh, ceramic called a thermal barrier coating, which is essentially sprayed onto the surface and then hardens. Those thermal barrier coatings are used extensively in land-based gas turbines where uh, weight is not a consideration. Now, if we want to try to control emissions out of our con combustion system, there's nothing we can do to create the formation of carbon dioxide if we're burning hydrocarbon fuels. So emissions control focuses on nitrous oxides, unburned hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and particulates, which is basically pure carbon. So removing these, uh, removing carbon monoxide, unburned hydrocarbons, and particulates requires basically making sure we have enough combustion time at high temperature for complete combustion. This is compatible with increasing the combustion efficiency. But reducing uh, nitrous oxides requires minimizing the residence time at high temperature. So this um, leads to the desire to keep the combustor small. So there's, these are sort of conflicting requirements. One solution to this problem is staged combustors. Um, basically, you can have different fuel injectors and or different regions that are used for high and low thrust condition. This can allow you to achieve some reduction in nitrous oxide emissions. Um, but if you want to do a lot better to, than this, you would need to do premixed combustion, which is not sort of a technology that's been proven to be air worthy yet. Um, but you can see that if you have sort of like a regular combustor, um, you can basically uh, start getting um, improvements in, in newer engines. Uh, as we move forward in time, uh, the uh, allowable limit of nitrous oxide is dropping um, as, the as the combustion architectures get more complex. Now let's spend the rest of the time talking today talking about turbines. So starting with the high pressure turbine, the high pressure turbine's pressure ratio and efficiency vary very little uh, with changes in rotational speed. We can see this here, so the performance map of a tur turbine is normally plotted a little differently. We put pressure ratio on the horizontal axis and a non-dimensional mass flow on, um, as well as efficiency on the vertical axes. And then again, we have lines of constant rotational speed. And especially in terms of the, the pressure ratio versus mass flow, what we see is that there's almost no dependence on the rotational speed. These curves all look like almost the same, um, especially when you consider the very small 
scale here. Um, and in efficiency, the variations are sort of, kind of on the order of 5%, so less than half of the efficiency variations in a compressor. So this means essentially that the turbine behaves like a choked nozzle as far as upstream components are concerned, unless the rotational speed is really low. So uh, there's a lack of dependence of the choking conditions on speed, um, which tells us that it's the stator or nozzle blade rows that give rise to the choking effects. Otherwise, they would be strongly dependent on rotational speed like we saw in the fan. Now, you can, it's, it's pretty rare to actually have choke flow in the turbines, but if you've got a lot of blade rows in a row where they're very, very, very close to being uh, choked, from the perspective of other components in the engine, this essentially emulates reels choking. Um, right, usually guide vanes are going to have Mach numbers just below one, and the combination of several such blade rows yield, yields basically choked behavior. We can really neglect these small variations in efficiency over operating ranges of interest, and so we can simplify our lives and assume, as was done earlier, that efficiency is constant in turbines. Things are not too different in a low pressure turbine. Um, there's lower Mach numbers, of course, in the LP turbines because of the reduced rotational speed, but they tend to also have more stages, um, you know, like maybe seven versus one or two. Um, and so the overall behavior is pretty similar to that of high pressure turbines. Um, so again, we're gonna be able to assume that the turbine behaves like a choke nozzle with constant efficiency. So now let's talk a little bit more about turbine cooling. So we typically choose to have about 20% of the mass load of the compressor be used for cooling in a modern engine. Most of this is used in the high pressure turbine. About half of that is gonna be used to cool the nozzle guide vanes um, in that first row, first, very first blade row. So this doesn't affect the cycle efficiency if we make the choice that T04 is the temperature between the nozzle guide vanes and the first rotor. The other half of that coolant mass flow is used to cool the rotors and downstream nozzle guide vanes, um, and that negatively impacts the turbine efficiency and the cycle work. Um, and we can look at a simple model of that effect here to be able to make quantifications. So a simple model of turbine cooling um, tries to capture the main effect that uh, work done uh, to compress air um, that's then used for cooling does not provide a maximum benefit in terms of cycle performance. If we assume that all the cooling air is taken at the high pressure compressor exit conditions, um, in reality we take it from as far upstream as possible to minimize the cycle efficiency penalties. Um, but uh, if we assume that, then the cooling air, um, and, and also say that our cooling air is going to be assumed to mix with the main flow at the local turbine pressure, that's a pretty good assumption. Um, and we assume no work is extracted from the cooling air, basically that the mixing uh, uh, all occurs downstream of the rotor. Um, that's not exactly right, but it's, it's, it's not, a, not, not a huge stretch. And once we make those assumptions, we can essentially write uh, first law for uh, what's happening for, say, a high pressure turbine rotor. Um, so we have the mass flow rate of air plus the mass flow rate of fuel times um, basically the CP of the, the um, combustion products at, at state four five prime, which is this sort of mixed gas that already ha has the cooling air added to it. And that's gonna be equal to what's going in. Um, this is basically a model for the mixing process between station four five and station four five prime where station 4.5 is the exit of the high pressure turbine and 4.5 prime is the entry to the low pressure turbine. So it's the same, um, the mass flow story is actually different because there's a cooling mass flow that's separate here and this is at T0.3 temperature out of the uh, high pressure compressor. So CPE is the specific heat capacity of the combustion products. CPE prime is the uh, specific heat capacity of the combined mixture of the combustion products and uh, the extra cooling air. Of course, the cooling air mass flow rate is just m dot uh, a45 minus m dot a4, and we'll assume that this mixing process occurs at constant pressure, so p not four five prime is p not four five. Um, so, for for given parameters, we can compute what's going on in the model relatively straightforwardly using that approach. Um, we would compute our turbine polytropic efficiency before the mixing process. So we would use station four or five for this. So polytropic efficiency for the high pressure turbine is defined like this, not using station four or five prime. 
and we can get the ratio of specific heats for the mixture of combustion products in air um, using R and CP. So to summarize, combustors are not amenable to analytical modeling, but overall um, practical performance can be included in engine models by just uh, taking uh, the first turbine uh, stator row to be part of the combustor and assuming a 4% stagnation pressure loss. Um, for turbines, uh, when they're choked, which is almost always, the non-dimensional mass flow is basically independent of rotational speed and the efficiency variation can generally be neglected. In the next few lectures, we'll use what we've learned about component characteristics to look at the off-design behavior of an entire engine.